<laughs> All right, so it is five o'clock. We're gonna just jump in and people can wander in as they, uh, as they wander in. All right. Welcome, welcome. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, uh, pattern libraries. Our goal today is to provide you with a couple of tips and tricks for converting mockups into patterns. Uh, and we're gonna give you some tools to write some really robust, reusable patterns uh, that should save you some time and money. All right, so who are we to introduce you to patterns? Um, well, my name is Cassandra Roberts. I am a, a senior front-end developer with Red Hat. I work on redhat.com. I am on the, uh, tech, I'm the tech lead on the UX development team with Kendall. And my passion is delivering highly reusable patterns. So it uh, fits in pretty well. <laughs> and um, I'm, I do a lot of the front-end JavaScript for redhat.com. Uh, also a new mom. So feel free to hit me up afterwards for baby pictures. And I am Kendall Totten, I'm also on the UX development team. I'm the team lead, and I work for Red Hat. And I've been there about three years. I've been in the Drupal space for close to 10 years um, in web development, a little bit longer than that. I did start in the design space, and I've kind of transitioned over to front-end development through time. Um, I've worked on some cool sites like DallasCowboys.com and Weather.com, and now Red Hat. And um, I'm passionate about reusable code as well. <laughs> so we're not actually here to tell you about patterns, because you probably heard of patterns. They're not new. Uh, Pattern Lab has been around for, I think, close to five years. Uh, Brad Frost and crew have been hustling it. And there's also some other cool libraries that are similar, like KSS Node, uh, Fractal, Mannequin. Um, so we're going to talk today about the different ways that you can take these same basic concepts that we see repeated in these pattern systems and show, them, show you how you can apply them to your mockups. Uh, but this is a front end talk, so don't worry. We're also going to throw in some twig and some code snippets. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about our system at Red Hat. So our system involves uh, a couple of different concepts, uh, atoms, components, subpatterns, patterns, and pattern groups. Uh, and we're going to focus largely on the center three. Uh, and these go from smallest to largest, um, often in terms of their options, uh, content, and complexity. All right, so mockups right away. Let's jump right in. So mockups for our blog redesign project are what we're going to show next. Um, but we're also going to sprinkle in a couple of little snapshots from other projects that we've worked on for redhat.com. So this is the blog listing mockup. And those of you who have worked with Envision will probably recognize the, uh, the framing of it. Uh, we use Envision for our design sharing tool. It gives us a common language with our designers. So the first thing that I like to do when I get a new set of mockups is print everything out and lay it all out in front of me and start to investigate all of the content without any agenda. Um, I'm starting to absorb the design, pay attention to the visuals, and all the little chunks of content that I, I see. Um, I'm taking a lot of copious notes, and I'm writing down any questions that I'm going to have for the designers about what interactions or mobile styles I might not be seeing in the mockups. All right, so this is the listing page, but from 10,000 feet. Uh, don't pay too much attention to the detail here. This is kind of giving you just an overview. Um, in red, you can see we have components. Yellow is our layout, kind of boxes. And then in the center here, these are uh, the components inside the layouts and sub-patterns, and purple is our patterns. Um, and this is just how we like to break apart when we're doing our architecture, all of the visual that we get. Um, if you have remote team members, one of the great tools that we like to use, we have a super awesome teammate, Chris. I think he's here in the back. Chris, what? Um, so uh, we work with Chris, who's remote, and so we like to use, um, this is done with Envision Freehand, which is really awesome. So it's really good to keep in mind if you're working with remote teams, having some kind of uh, digital whiteboarding tool, because it really helps for everyone to be able to sit down and collaborate together and draw. Um, but yeah, don't worry about this. We're, we'll go into a deep dive in the next few sections. So step one, go through all the mockups. Uh, absorbing the design, looking for common threads. Be careful not to jump into coding too quickly. It can lead to inefficiencies in how you build your system. I am the number one offender of this. I love code. All I want to do is code. The first thing I start thinking about when I look at it is how I'm going to write it. But it's really important to step back, put your coder hat to the side, and put on your architecture hat and start thinking about you know, what are the pieces and parts. 
Next, you're gonna be starting to challenge any subtle differences that you identify in your mockups because it's really important to have consistency across your design system. This is good for not just you as the front end developer, it's also really good for your users because the, anything that is uh, different is gonna uh, deviate for your user as well. Um, you want consistency across the board and <coughs> Nielsen Norman will back me up on this. Um, Jacob Nielsen of the Nielsen Norman Group. I'm a huge fangirl. I love their research. Um, so this is a great quote. Consistency is the most powerful usability principle. When things behave the same, users don't have to worry about what will happen. So be, uh, use this as to back you up when you're talking to your designers um, because it's really important that you have that consistency. Uh, card paddings is a really great example. You'll notice this as you're looking at mockups. A lot of times the card padding will deviate in all of the different mockups. You'll see, oh, five pixels here, 10 pixels here, 20 pixels here. Uh, why is it different? And sometimes the answer is it does need to be different because it's fitting in a different design or um, the element itself is too narrow or the breakpoints that we want need to call for certain different padding. Use those to inform your design system rather than surfacing that to an editor. So something like that can be done through breakpoints or element queries. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be something new. So focus on how and why those deviations serve the user. <clears throat> this is another example. This is the um, toggle indicator. So you'll notice we have uh, a drop-down list over here, and then we've got a menu with an accordion, and they have different indicators, and we're trying to teach our user how to use our website. So we wanna go back to the des designer and ask, which would you prefer? If you could only have one, which one do you think better communicates that this is a drop-down? Typography, this one's a fun conversation to have. So it can be, it can be a little difficult, but um, consistency helps your user, right? So some of the titles here are black, some of the titles are red, but the contexts are really similar and the content isn't that different. So we wanna ask, can this be made more consistent? Um, after we've done that first pass um, with all of our initial questions for the designers, uh, what's the next step? Well, thank you. You may want to start by asking yourself some questions. Now, this might seem silly or uncomfortable, but trust us, if you can ask the right questions, it can be a big help. We recommend that you start with content. Now, someone famous once said, content is king, but since his name rhymes with Phil Gates of Microsoft, we're not gonna mention it here, uh, we'll just say that content is really important and you should start there. And I think Jeff Eaton actually mentioned this yesterday in the summit, um, that this is the most important part of your CMS, right? So if you can train yourself to focus on content first and not the styles and not the grid or the JavaScript framework you're gonna use, uh, then you're off to a good start. And as a side note for this section, if you hear me mention components, don't worry about what a component is yet. We'll get there and we'll get into some details. So first of all, you wanna ask yourself what kind of content is in the mockup. Uh, make a list of the different kinds of things you're seeing. If it's a dynamically generated view of content that you're pulling in somewhere, from somewhere else, you may not need to worry about the content editor. But if you're expecting a human to plug in this content somewhere, you might want to put yourself in their shoes. So consider their mental model as opposed to what you're actually seeing in the mockups, and notice they might be different. So here's an example of a featured article teaser box. And we've got a cute little tag up in the corner, we've got the date, and then we have like a large title at the bottom. But if I'm a content editor building this, probably I'm gonna want to add the title first, and then the date, and then the tags or any other metadata. Next, ask yourself if you can collapse any field sets that are not required or superfluous settings to just kind of get them out of the way. They're there if the content admin needs them, but you wanna make sure they're absolutely focused on the content first. Um, figure out if you can reduce the number of field sets you're giving to them right off the bat. Uh, if there's any way that you can dynamically add them, like through paragraphs or some other utility where they can just say, I want to add another set, I want to add another set, that'd be a great way to minimize the uh, editor experience. And finally, consider their role. Now, on our team, we have a very large group of people that we work with that work on redhat.com, and people generally tend to fall into camps, uh, designers and content editors. Not to say that those are mutually exclusive, maybe you have a power user who's both of those things, um, but we tend to think that our, our content writers and editors, they're not as focused on the design. They don't really wanna have to worry about design details, so we don't wanna put that on their shoulders. But if they're a designer, if they're part of the UX team, maybe we do wanna give them a lot more settings. So consider that when you're building patterns. 
Next, when you're breaking apart a design into fields, ask yourself just how related are these fields? And yes, they're all related because they're on the same page, so probably you're talking about the same thing, but you want to break it down. So kind of try to figure out, are they tangentially related, like distant cousins? Are they the same vampire that appears throughout history time and time again? If you don't know about this meme, it's really spooky, look it up. <laughs> also, I just really wanted Keanu in my presentation, selfishly. So it's easy to think all those fields are related, but try to keep them small. Okay, here's an example. This is our article teaser component, and yes, it contains all of those fields, because hindsight is 2020. So if I were to do this again, I would probably try to remove that bottom section, the tags at the bottom, because that on its own could probably be a very reusable component. In fact, I know I saw that on our blog detail mockups. It kind of appears in the top corner. So I would split that out. And next, I think I would try to remove the section where it's the summary and then a little like read more link, because I see that all over the place and teasers for all kinds of content. So I think I'd remove that too. So finally, I know it's kind of hard to see, there's a blue box going on there. Uh, finally, we've got the header section of this teaser, and I just am down to my title, dates, uh, authors, and URL. So that's a little bit more simplistic. I can run with that. So when you're looking at your new mockups, if you have been working on this site for a while, try to ask yourself, does this look like something I've already seen? If I have a design system, is there maybe already a component out there that I can reuse? An important point, though, is to not focus on what it looks like, but actually the fields that are going on behind the scenes. If it looks like something else, uh, that's great. Make a sticky note, and maybe there's a SAS placeholder you can create and extend, uh, or a mix-in, perhaps. Um, but the components, we want to focus on the content fields. But be careful. If something similar exists, <laughs> question just how complex is it already? Because we want to follow our design system commandments and not reinvent the wheel, very important. But we also don't want to shoehorn something together or make it so complex that it ceases to be reusable at all. All right, if you're ready, we have a quiz for you. This there is, <laughs> there's unicorns on them, for those of you in the back. Um, this is a RSS link that we saw in our blog mockup. And we're going to review a couple of things that already exist in our system. The first is a social share component. And then next to it, we have a taxonomy header component. The naming is of no consequence. So we're kind of trying to look for things that are similar. Anybody have any ideas? If you think this is a trick, you're right. <laughs> because I didn't tell you what fields were building those components. And I just said you should look for fields. So here's your next clue. These are the basic fields that are making up these components. Anybody want to try now? Which one of these would you use? Left, sure. The left, exactly. All right, this gentleman here in the front, would you like a unicorn? Unicorns? <laughs> oh, this is Tony. All right, well, we have these. <laughs> so, yes, that is the correct answer, social share component. And again, with the blue boxes, okay. We're highlighting that actually, in fact, the styles are quite similar too. So we have a label, we have one icon, and it doesn't matter what's in the icon, right? That's just an SVG we can swap out. So it's kind of a red herring that our, our taxonomy header component already came with an RSS icon. It doesn't matter. That's, it's actually content, even though it's part of the design. All right, so I have one more very simple example for you uh, of a component where our content fields have stayed consistent over time. It's simple, it's just the text within a link, the link URL, and then the title, tease, you know, hover tip. Um, so we have one setting on this component called type. And even though our fields have remained the same over time, we keep adding to the type. So first we just had primary and secondary. It was either a big red box or a blue link. And then later we kind of got into this ghost button idea where we've got like the outline and later a brick which will grow to fill the container that you place it into. So we evolved the styles of the component because those are easy to flex with, right? But we didn't have to touch the fields. Context for the win. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, so components. Now we'll kind of deep dive into components. Uh, these are the building blocks of your system, and if you can get these right, they will be your best friends later on down the road and serve you well. Um, components are bite-sized chunks of how we control the uh, experience of the content editor and the users. So we're going to lay out a couple of techniques um, for how to build reusable components. All right, so here's our blog listing page. In the top section, we have a blog post teaser, which we've seen previously, headline, date, authors, brief summary, and a link to the article. 
And down at the bottom, we have the blue boxes, uh, similar sets of information, just smaller and simpler, uh, date, headline, and a link. So the main featured blog post uses the same component as the featured boxes inside the cards. Does it have a few more fields? Sure. Are those fields in a different order? Yep, that's no biggie. Uh, the key here is that the content underneath is the same. That said, let the thing be the thing. And this is Kendall quoting Micah, co quoting Ben Frayne, quoting probably someone else because it's a great example of how things migrate through our community. So let the thing be the thing. Don't try to shoehorn everything into one component. If it looks similar but it has different content, just let it be its own component. We know naming is hard. I think we say this probably three times a day. Uh, so here's a couple of rules of thumb that we use. Keep component field names super generic, whereas your patterns and your subpatterns can get really specific and more contextual. Uh, let's do one together. This will involve audience participation, so there's some more sparkles in your, in your future. All right, so this mock-up shows a list of speakers at an event, kind of like this one, and their bios. Um, we're trying to name this component down here in red. Let's see a couple of other variations. All right, so same family of mock-ups. Mm, looks pretty similar. Name, description, different styles, but we can adjust styles in a component using a setting, so let's look beyond those variations for now. All right, so here's a view of the component by itself. Let's look really closely at the fields. We have a name, job title and company, and a bio. Okay, well, what if we want to put something after the name that isn't necessarily related to their job? There might be a mock-up with presentation times in that same spot. That would be useful information. Um, so we're going to go a little more generic for that field name. Metadata is pretty open-ended. Um, it basically just says anything that's related to this component. All right. So what would you guys name this component? Teaser? Introduction? Introduction? Persona. Subheading, persona. Persona's getting close. Speaker, cards. Who said persona? Yeah? OK, it's really close. Person, that's what we went with. Um, so person's really open-ended, right? Person versus a speaker. A speaker is boxing us into an event context. So it kind of prevents us from being able to reuse this outside of that. What if we wanted to include it in a bio page where we've got a list of all of our CEOs? Or if we wanted to include information uh, in some other context besides an event? So person allows us to reuse that component. It's a little more generic. <laughs> Components and their field names are the place where we want to stay generic. And again, um, the patterns and the subpatterns are where we'll get back to context and specificity. So here's a few more examples of components in our system, very generically named. Uh, we're focusing on naming them for what they are and not what they actually contain. So um, we've got a call to action, an image embed, a standard header, things like that, a teaser, quotes, footnotes, just kind of giving you a, a general picture of what's in our design system here. Um, and then we're letting this same naming process bleed through to our CSS classes as well, so it keeps it really open-ended. All right, so some really exciting stuff. In our components, there are basically two types of different fields. We have content fields, and we have setting fields. So content is where a user puts their content in, pretty straightforward, but settings are the real power in the system. Settings let the editor make decisions about how it looks or the semantic markup without necessarily knowing that that's what they're doing. So in this example, you can see primary doesn't necessarily let the editor decide that the button is going to be red. Primary just means tell us what is the most important link on the page. Is it the most important, or is it maybe a secondary link? But you might be saying, OK, but my editor really wants to add a red button on this page. They're really focused on that. All right, well, help text. <laughs> help text is super cheap, really easy to add and change in the system. Uh, it doesn't require you go update a bunch of database fields or raw HTML markup to make that change. In our system, if we want to update primary from being red we, to blue, um, and that happens, sometimes your, your business comes back to you and they say, uh, OK, we want everything on the site to be blue now because we've rebranded, um, you can make that change by making a one-line change in your CSS variables. Uh, and that will propagate across the system without having to go touch a bunch of pages or make a bunch of markup updates. 
All right, so here's another example. This is a semantic example. Uh, this is our component called a band header. And when you're dealing with headings, uh, your SEO experts are really going to want you to use the right semantic markup, because that semantic markup is going to fuel how you rank in your, your search results. And not all of us can have a super awesome SEO PhD. We got any PhDs in here? Yeah. No? No. Well, <laughs> Kendall, no. <laughs> All right, so um, we have a couple of SEO experts on our team, and this was really important to them that we start using this markup correctly. But our content editor isn't necessarily going to know what an H2 or an H3 is. They just know what their content is. Uh, and so what we're getting from them is, tell us what the most important information is in your content. So here's the fields. We've surfaced to them two options, position and priority. So we've asked them to identify the position on the page. Is this in the hero or is this in the body content? And then we've asked them to tell us the priority of the different headings. So we have a, a title and a headline field. So we've surfaced that in this dropdown. And they're making the decision based on what they know about the content. So as front end developers, we can't know what that content is going to be. There's no way for us to programmatically tie that in. Twig, we promised you twig. So here's some twig. Special. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so this is how we parse out what the correct markup should be. We take the information from the editor, that position primary priority, and we convert that into title tag and headline tag. So you can see we're setting up correct SEO markup. All right, layouts. Layouts are kind of confusing, and they kind of set our system apart a little bit from um, most design systems, so we're going to go a little more in-depth in here. Um, and if you abstract layouts away from your components, uh, they can be really powerful, and they're very reusable. Layouts are containers that uh, have markup and styles, but never typography. Uh, they're just pigeonholes you can put stuff into. Uh, and this is a little different than the containers that we have in Drupal. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? I mean, there's the layout module or you know, layout UI in Drupal 8 that you probably have heard of or plenty of constructs around layout in Drupal. So kind of put that aside for a moment and just focus on the really basic concept of layout as a bucket. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you use a layout when you want to arrange and space apart different components, uh, hide and show your content, if you want to set a background image or color, uh, you can also use it to add rule lines or borders between different elements. Um, ours are pretty small, but um, you can have some pretty complex layouts. Uh, and they can act as the layout for the whole page, but in general, uh, we keep them pretty, pretty small. So here's an example, a card. If these were all different components, can you imagine how many different times we would have to code the container padding, the background styles, the margins between the text and the call to action? It would be a headache. It would be a lot of code. So in this example, we have a couple of different subpatterns, each utilizing the card layout. So each subpattern has a section for components. And you can see in blue, we have all of the components kind of um, separated out. Uh, and you have a content component and a call to action component and some different styles. There's some color, some alignment settings, uh, and all of that is abstracted into the layout. But each layout has the same basic sections. You have a card header, a card body, and a card footer. So let's look a little closer at the architecture of a card. This is a YAML so that you can kind of get a sense. We use uh, JSON schema, and YAML is how we feed in some example data into our JSON schema. So this will give you a sense of the data structure. Um, we have a couple of settings at the top for background, and you can use an imaged background or just a color. Um, you can have an overlay if you're um, doing an image so that your text is a little more readable on top. Uh, and there's also a separate background section here. And this is so that your heading can have a different background color than the global card. Our system is using the at symbol to indicate that we're pulling in a component. So you can see in the header, body, and footer, we're pulling in the card header, quote, and call to action, respectively, into those different buckets. And then here you're seeing that kind of layout pull back out. All right, so a band. 
Um, this one's a fun, so <laughs> here's some of our mockups from redhat.com. We use a striped design, and so if you kind of squint and let the content blur out, you can start to see that design and that banding start to pull out in these mockups. And bands are a really easy system in our layout, uh, using layouts. So this is a band layout. It has a band header, a band body, and a footer with an optional aside that can render on the left or the right. Pretty straightforward, and we're just putting components into those different fields so that we can render a band. All right, so layouts, awesome, super excited. I hope you're all jazzed. But are we surfacing these to our content editors? What if you don't want your content editor to have access to the background color and the alignment and to choose from this whole list of components that you have in your system? Am I building a different layout for every single use case? Subpatterns, no need. You, you can use a subpattern to control what the editor accesses. So a subpattern is a really cool concept in our system. It combines components into a layout while controlling what settings and options are being surfaced to your editors. These are really iterable, and they're really great for grid-style layouts where editors might be adding multiple chunks of related data. And subpatterns can actually contain other subpatterns. So you can go pretty deep, so just be careful. Don't lose yourself. Pop culture reference. <laughs> <laughs> So here's an example, quote box, combines settings and a logo, and a quote component, and a call to action. Requires fewer choices be made by the content editor, and combines a bunch of commonly used pieces. Image, quote, call to action. Pretty straightforward, and just focuses on the content. But it's all being rendered inside of a card layout with a background, and we're choosing image sizing settings for them. They're not having to make any of those decisions. They're just focusing on the content. This example is called download set. This is a way to access digital assets. And um, in our old system, you would have a big old list that Kendall will show you later of um, you know, 25 options so that you could add as many assets as you needed or as few assets as you needed. But you still have to scroll through all those fields. Um, in our system, you just add it one at a time for as many as you need. It combines um, all of these components, this digital asset component, into a layout that we call a divider layout. And it's just called divider because it adds a divider line between the components. And this allows us to iterate and offer them uh, a lot of flexibility. And here is, here is the subpattern in context. So this is a downloads band. And we're surfacing the download set subpattern inside of the download span. So we have one, two, three. And you can see as few or as many assets are being added as they would like in this view. All right, so building a subpattern. There's basically two schools of thought when building a subpattern. You have ones that are built for content editors and ones that are built for your power users that Kendall mentioned earlier, your user experience teams, your design web teams, et cetera. Editor subpatterns are focused on content, and they have a lot of design settings baked in already in your Twig, uh, hard-coded. And the power users um, have a lot more design options. The editor patterns are also really great for Drupal dynamic views, because you're just working on plugging in the content that you have from Drupal into predefined designs. So here's an example of an editor subpattern. This is a product card, and it's how we sell products on redhat.com on our store. And you can see we're focusing on, in the YAML just on the content. We're just asking them to put in all their content information and make minimal design decisions. We're even abstracting out some information instead of asking them to identify the color, uh, blue at the top here. We just ask them to identify the product line that this is a part of, and then we use that information in order to figure out what color to service in the card. This one is an event box example, and it is um, a way of clicking through to our detail pages on our event listing. Again, we're just focusing on the content, just getting the information first from our users, and then we're using the type in person as a way of deciding what colors and alignments and settings to use for the card. And that way, the editor doesn't have to make any decisions. All they have to do is put in the information that they know about this event. 
This one's a little different. This is a subpattern that's actually just simple, simplifying a component. There is no layout involved. We're just taking an existing component in our system that has a lot of options and settings, and we're saying, we don't want you to interface with all of these options. We don't want you to make decisions as an editor about what kind of CTA. We just want you to put in the link. Just give us the link information. So here's the subpattern, just links. No additional settings. Um, we do have variables in the Twig surface that our Drupal can map to. Um, and that way, you can still make changes to this if you need to or override settings. But there's fallbacks. So if they don't enter in anything or we don't feed any variables in, it's still going to work. And then here's an example for our power users. We call this a standard text box. <laughs> it's, it's really just a way of putting text in a card with a call to action. And the uh, design team has a lot of options. They can do alignment, they can do background colors, they can do images, they can decide what kind of call to action goes there. Um, so there's a lot of choices, and this is the kitchen sink, as we call it. You know, give them everything that they could possibly want to make uh, their custom designs, their little snowflakes. <laughs> Alrighty, so now that you understand the basics of subpatterns, as you might have guessed, patterns are just the larger version, bigger and better. Um, and so we've already illustrated how useful they can be. So in this section, we're going to kind of get into the weeds of how you can assemble them. So when you're thinking about a pattern, think about it as a recipe. It says, go and get these ingredients and assemble them like so and sprinkle on some settings, really get the metaphor going. <laughs> so the UI goal, like we keep harping on, is really just to stay as minimal as possible and focus on content. Um, because they're only referencing the components and layouts. And we're doing so by vehicle of a twig mechanism that you're probably familiar with, um, embeds or includes. So what we're basically doing on the left here, or sorry, on the right, you can see an example of some code for a pattern where we're saying, uh, go and get the card or group layout and put the icon panel component inside of it. Notice that there's no HTML markup here. Um, and just to kind of drill in a little bit, one of the examples of a variable for a setting that we are surfacing is container background. So you can see we're plugging in that variable and we're giving it to the layout so it knows what color to be. But at the top, we're also utilizing that same variable to determine which layout we want to go get. Because if we're not setting a background color, it's fine to just render it in a group, which is essentially a div. We're just wrapping it. Um, but if we're loading a background color, we probably need some extra padding baked in so the text doesn't touch the edge of the container. So we're doing some logic up there. And then at the bottom, when we go get that icon panel component, there's a setting called alignment. And in this use case, we've decided to not surface that to the admin. So you can see we've just hard-coded the value that we've decided makes the most sense for this particular pattern, and we just baked it right in. Now, here's an example of a testimonial band uh, pattern. And you can see that the top of it, even though it says background options, you could kind of think of background as a designy sort of thing. Uh, but in the context of a testimonial, we're expecting them to upload a, a, a picture of the person who's saying the quote. So really, it's kind of content. Because if it's Johnny Cash saying the quote, we really want his face next to it, because that's cool. And the configuration um, setting that we're surfacing is layout, because if Johnny Cash is on the left side of the image, we want to put the quote on the right, or vice versa. So we have to give them just the minimal amount that they need to get by, and then back to the content settings. Now, unlike social media, patterns are a great place to incorporate logic. <laughs> so rather than incorporating all of these different settings, see what else you can infer from the settings the content admins are already giving you. So now here's an example where we saw this in our, our band, or sorry, our blog listing page. Uh, and this is some social media tiles. And even though these are technically dynamically created with Twitter, for the sake of argument, we're going to pretend that our content admin is filling these out. So the first one is a red background. The second one is white. And the most important thing here is that we reverse the text color so that it remains readable no matter what background color we have. So um, we used to have a system where we had a setting called theme. And we said, content admin, it's really important that you reverse your text color. So remember, if you use a black background or red background, you've got to remember to switch the theme. They would forget. They would become confused. They didn't understand why a dark theme meant light text. It was, it was a mess. So later we realized, by virtue of documentation, that we actually had all the information we needed. We knew if it was a red background, they should change the theme to dark. So we used Twig logic to kind of bake it all in and do it for them. Now, here's an example of the markup behind the scenes, because this is an important point. Don't worry about all the craziness. But we're focusing on a couple pieces here. So we, have, we use data attributes to style our stuff. And I know it's wrong and bad. 
but forgive us because we love it. And it's very readable. So you can see we have a data attribute for background, and you can see it says red and white. And we have a separate data attribute for theme, which says dark and light. And we've actually added a desaturated theme later on because we realized we don't want blue links on red tiles, so we're gonna go ahead and accommodate for that. Now the important point here is they're separate. We have built-in logic, but we've kept the attributes separate. They're separate fields in our database. So later when we wanna break these apart or do more with the logic, it's still very clean. Now here's one example. I think we actually already saw something similar with our featured event card, but I wanted to highlight how easy this is for a content admin to very quickly change the design and get something wildly different. So we're saying, tell us about this event box that you're building. Is it the primary? Is it the most important event on the page? Or is it perhaps secondary? When they choose one of those things, you can see the background color gets more exciting, the text gets bigger, the layout changes, and so all that stuff is baked in. And because we're in the pattern section, I was kind of cheating by showing you the sub-pattern. Here it is in context. This is the full pattern that's loading all three of those things. And we're actually pulling dynamic data into this. So when we mapped it in Drupal, we said the first one's primary, the second two are secondary. Done. And more twig. <laughs> this is what it looks like behind the scenes. So we've taken that one configuration setting called emphasis, and we've said, when somebody chooses primary, here's all of the things that we're gonna do with that information. And again, we've kept it separate. We actually have a couple of things up here that look layout related, layout and alignment, because we're spacing apart the text or we're putting the imagery next to the text and we're doing a lot there. So we wanted to keep them all separate as possible. Um, the padding difference. So a stacked is 30 pixels of padding between each component and min stacked is 15. Good question. Unicorn. <laughs> all right. So now here's an action band pattern, which is also on our blog listing page. And I love this example because it showcases how we were able to reuse the same mini article teaser component over and over again, and also the same list layout over and over again. Now, this is a cool example because when we got these mock-ups, we took them back to the design team and we said, hang on, design inconsistencies, what's up with that? Why do these ones have bullets and those ones have rule lines between each one? And they said, oh, well, it's because those ones have a date. And the bullets kind of look weird when the content starts wrapping and there's an extra chunk, so like, we wanted to do rule lines instead. We're like, okay, that actually makes sense, so can we just go ahead and bake in that logic? So if a date appears, uh, then we'll just add the rule lines. They're like, yeah, sounds good. So we're utilizing the very same components and layouts, and we're just adding a little extra uh, data attribute spice. So I'm highlighting here, this is their data RH list style. It's called flush, which just means there's no bullets. It lines up with the edge of the container, and it also gets those rule lines in between. And just so you can see it in action. Uh, this is the sub-pattern. Again, I'm cheating. Uh, but the sub-pattern, you can see when I'm removing or adding back the date, it's dynamically updating and changing all of those styles. Brilliant. So remember, the takeaway here is it's not just about what you see in the pattern, it's also about what you don't see. Smoke and mirrors. <laughs> So let's get technical, because this might all sound super cool. IT crowd fans, what's up? <laughs> so this might sound cool, but you're thinking, I don't know, it sounds like a lot of work. But there's a lot of code out there that you can lean on. And I want to take it back old school and just remind you, this isn't a new concept. We've been doing this since display modes, right? Display modes say, use the same set of fields, same content, and render it a few different ways. So conceptually, you could kind of use this model and start using the same concepts. Um, and this is the paragraphs module, which we actually are using. We're turning our JSON schemas into paragraph bundles in Drupal. And paragraphs module is saving us from the horrors of infinite fields. <laughs> so this is what we mentioned earlier. This is our old event content type. I don't even want to tell you how many fields are here. It's disgusting. And they have to keep scrolling and scrolling. But now, with paragraphs, we have a download band pattern, which the content admin can just say, yep, that's the one that I want to add. And as soon as they do that, then they fill out a couple pieces of information about the heading and they get right into the sub-patterns. They add a download set sub-pattern and then they've got some components inside of that for digital assets. They can add one or two if they want it and be done. All right, because we're short on time and this is a quick session here, I wanted to just give you a lot to walk away with and go research on your own. So handful of modules, paragraphs I already mentioned. Uh, the components module for Drupal 8 is what takes your components and registers them in your module or theme. It registers them as Twig namespaces so that you can basically structure and organize all of your Twig templates in a model that makes sense to you or use the pattern lab approach or whatever, and then bring it back and let your Drupal templates make use of them. 
Uh, the UI Patterns module does something similar. It takes all of your, your components and makes them registrable as plugins for things like panels or views um, or any other display mode. And this code section here is because the community is always hard at work trying to basically drive this concept home and incorporate patterns into Drupal. I encourage you to go check out these projects. A lot of cool stuff happening here. Uh, much of it is Drupal 8. We're on Drupal 7, but if you're on Drupal 8, this is for you. And Pattern Kit, uh, we, we gave a shout out to Micah earlier. Uh, Micah helped um, basically build the tool that you were seeing when we were showing you the previews. If it didn't look like Drupal, that was Pattern Kit. So everything we're building is actually outside of Drupal, and then we're just importing it in, which is really fabulous. We have like a real time way of previewing what we're building. And Element Queries. If you were wondering how we can take a sub-pattern and drop it in anywhere on the page and have it be responsive, it's because we're not using media queries. We don't care if it takes up the full width of the page or it's tucked into a sidebar, uh, because we're using a, a neat JavaScript library to basically detect the size of the container width. It's fab. And then finally, we're going to do a shameless plug for <laughs> a talk that we previously gave, gave about our CSS approach. Uh, it's called Beaks, and it takes the best from Smacks and BEM, and it's block element attribute, which is the data attributes that you saw earlier. So definitely check that out. And then finally, a lovely video series and blog post that I thought was fascinating, so I wanted to include it. All right, top three takeaways. Because you're thinking, sounds cool, do I really wanna to go to all this trouble? Can I just keep styling my Drupal content types the way that I always have? Like, I'm a themer, I know what I'm doing here. And I, I feel you, because there's a lot of time that goes into learning theming. But Simplicity is a really big win. Simplicity, especially for your content, or your, sorry, your, your editors that are plugging content into your system every single day. These people are hard at work, give them some love. Uh, simplify their experience and bake in all of that design stuff, because we like to dump it all on their shoulders. We're like, this is where you edit the blocks, this is how you change the view. You're definitely gonna wanna change that plugin and add that setting, and it's a lot. So bring it back down to earth for them. Uh, as a themer, as a front-end developer, simplify your life. Allow yourself the ability to reuse the, car the code that you worked so hard to write and not reinvent the wheel. Raise your hand if you've ever had the feeling of deja vu, like, I know I've styled this before, <laughs> right? Yes, escape that. <laughs> and finally, of course, your end user. Your site visitor deserves to have a simple user experience. If they take the time to learn how to navigate your menu system, don't make them relearn it on a different page. If they figure out how to hide and show content in an accordion, reuse that pattern. Let them understand it again and again. Flexibility. We talked a lot about this, about bundling settings, and I really want to harp on this because this is actually something Jeff Eaton said yesterday in uh, the summit, and I was like, that is so spot on. He, he referred to this concept as design metadata. So rather than saying, do you want it to be red or do you want it to be blue, call it primary. If you can abstract a little bit, you are maintaining control of what primary means. You can bundle the settings, you're simplifying it for them, but you're kind of keeping, keeping it in-house. And if you can infer settings through logic, um, basically if you could say, hey, I saw that you added three components, so I'm gonna give you a three column layout. Wouldn't that be sassy? <coughs> Magic. <laughs> Do the work for them. And like we talked about theme, you could, we infer the text color for them when they change the background color. And last but not least, time and money, because that's why we're all here, right? <laughs> So yes, this is an upfront investment. I won't pretend that this is something that you could do overnight or you know, start using tomorrow without a little bit of legwork. So it's an upfront investment, so you wanna take this back and discuss this with your business, your product owners, and convince them that this is a really great system because ultimately you're going to save time by being able to reuse your patterns and your components. Uh, we're about three years into the system and I can attest this is, this is a great system because we still love working on it and that's never happened before. I've never worked on a project for that long where I'm like, I love being in this code every day. Like usually it's spaghetti. So we're able to reuse our code and we just got um, a whole new set of mock-ups for our, our newest section of our blog and we're like, yeah, we got a component for that. We've got a layout, no problem, we'll add a tweak, done. <laughs> And finally, get your designers excited about this. Um, this took a little bit of work because designers don't love the word templates. They don't like to feel like they're boxed in. But when you, they understand that they have maintained control behind the scenes, and when they ask you to make a change, you're like, no problem, I can do that. <laughs> because you have control. So we're about out of time here, so I want to uh, give a shout out, again, there's Micah, his beautiful face. We want to give a shout out to Micah, but you can follow all three of us on Twitter. He is definitely the most active. If you're a night owl, <laughs> 3 a.m., Micah's tweeting. It's weird. Um, and then finally, we want to open it up to questions. So if you have any questions, please come up to the mic and 
Sorry, I just want to do a quick plug. Um, if you're looking for these slides, you can find them at uh, bit.ly, uh, DrupalCon, one word, all lowercase, DrupalCon-2018. And we're going to do a quick, quick plug here for also reviewing the session, if you would be so kind, if you enjoyed it, um, and also the DrupalCon survey. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>so um i thought element queries were like like kind of had, had had lost some steam um did snugug kind of pick it back up or someone else or they're what? alive and well i don't That's know awesome. i mean <laughs> there's i definitely have seen a few different libraries approaches to element queries and i will say you have to be careful about how you implement it i don't think it's wise to put an element query on everything on the page so our approach has been to add element queries to our sub patterns because we know that's something that's probably going to be variable in size because it could be in a sidebar or it could take up the full width of the band. And we don't put it on components because that would be 101 queries on the page. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Hey, so this is really encouraging to see because you know, sort of validating for stuff that I've been doing on a site that's about to launch. Um, but one of the things that I'm concerned about as I'm about to launch, uh, sort of just that first, uh, 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 yeah, the, the first release of it, is am I going to be able to have the system evolve over time, refactor these patterns, how they evolve? Are there any insights that you have, since it sounds like you've been released with this for a while, about what things are important to be doing right uh, when you first build the patterns so that you can refactor them over time. Things like, you know, those, those little changes that happened that you thought, oh, the pattern was this way, well actually maybe it should be this other way and all that. Yeah, um, don't add it to your schema unless you're sure that you want that for all eternity. <laughs> because the only way to get rid of it without doing a breaking change is to hide it and then it's gonna exist in your database no matter what. So once it's in your database, it's in your database. And you have to respect that choice that your editor has made. Um, that one's been the hardest for us to try and uh, evolve and walk away from certain settings that we don't want to exist anymore. Um, we're kind of locked in. So definitely be wary of what you're putting in your database and what information you're collecting. If you can get it in your twig instead, or um, get by with, with something you think, I might need this in the future, but I don't need it right now, don't put it in your schema yet. Just put it as a variable in your twig and set it, hard code it, and then you can always add, you can always add to your schema later. Um, it's easy to add, it's harder to take away. And I'll add one thing, which is to say that y'all are getting the benefit of us working on this for three years. <laughs> so all of the things that we are telling you to do, we probably learned the hard way <laughs> about naming our components generic and then the patterns getting more specific, things like that. Thanks. Question. Yeah, so I think, I think the question was, uh, do you create a new atom for every field? Just to kind of boil it down. Um, so, well, yeah, basically, I mean, do I, is that something I need to be doing? Um, so I focus on just making atoms when I see a field that is complex enough that we would need to reuse it a lot. Uh, an example of this would be we wrote an atom for a summary, the, the teaser summary that you saw in our example. Uh, we wrote an atom for that because there was some logic behind the scenes saying, like, how many words do we want to surface in our teaser before we do the dot, 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 read more? Um, so we, we kind of abstracted that. If there's some complexity in that, uh, then pulling that out into an atom is really nice. But if it's just a standard text field, uh, it's not necessary. Um, another great place for an atom would be we use um, certain HTML tags are allowed from our content editors in summary in text fields. And so we will surface uh, an atom so that we can con kind of consistently control those HTML tags for a more consistent editor experience. So if we want the editor to be able to add italics or bold or you know something else but not add links or not add p tags, then we will write a special twig um, atom for that so that we can parse that out separately. But you don't necessarily need for simple Drupal concepts to create an atom for it. 
I was just going to add, we do have a couple um, for like image embeds because it's integrating with the media module. Um, and another for Link, whenever we want to make use of, we, have, we use a tool called Linkit, which is another module that helps you go find content on your page and build the correct URL for it. Uh, so if we want to make use of those, there's a little bit of Drupal integration. So we'll lean on an atom to kind of build that bridge. Did that answer your question? Right. Thank you. It's really great to see that Pattern Kit is still alive and kicking. Uh, I'm a, I'm and a I have plans for it, too. <laughs> I, I'm a huge fan. I'm coming from the Pattern Lab world, uh, along with Evan Lovely, who you had up on the screen earlier. Yeah. Uh, earlier. So we've been you know, trying to keep the Pattern Lab lights on for the last uh, couple years. Um, I guess my question is more from a content authoring, and heck, even Drupal developer downstream, consuming what you guys are shipping from the design system. You know, atoms and components totally make sense. Um, do you find that they're actually working at that lower level, having to deal with every possible option, or is the abstraction with you know, choose your layout and then choose your sub component, uh, sub pattern, or your pattern really where that part of the team is really operating at? So when you're describing, well, let me try to summarize the question. I think yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. Are you asking what the development team has to interact with the patterns? What's their experience like? I, I guess one thing that we've noticed is having every, you know, having every component be a kitchen sink can get overwhelming very quickly. Mm -hmm. So that's why you boil it down to a sub, a sub pattern or a pattern. Are content authors the main audience for those two, or is it also really like? It's pre-configuring how you want, like how you want to, uh, pre-configuring how you want your nitty-gritty component or atom to actually show up. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, sorry. Let me just yeah. let yeah. me jump in real quick because I, I I see where you're going there, <laughs> and um, I have been strongly encouraging. So our our dev team when we're mapping um, mm -hmm. for something that's dynamic content in Drupal, when we're mapping, it was originally mapping directly to a layout and calling a component mm -hmm. and. I'll be honest, I'm, I'm very designy, and I was really unhappy with some of the results of that because I found that some of the settings weren't being set correctly or you know, there was a lot of guidance necessary for building that out. And it was a lot of complexity, like you mentioned. And right. so I've been strongly encouraging when mapping to go through our patterns. Don't even touch the sub-patterns. Like, the sub-patterns you'll access through the pattern, but always go through a pattern is what I've been strongly encouraging our dev team to do when mapping. And that's been really great in ensuring that we don't end up with any what we call ugly babies. <laughs> you, get you, get, you get repeatable designs that look good. Yeah. yeah. And are consistent, right, and across the site. Yeah. Nice work. Yeah, I will definitely say pa mapping was a bit of a headache early on before we kind of got into the, the heavy pattern system. Um, where we went through so many cycles just trying to get Drupal fields to match up with what we were building outside of Drupal and these components and patterns. Uh, so really, it's been a great catch-all for both editors and developer mappers alike. So I'm sorry if this is too uh, technical of a question for the end of the day at the end of the session, but <laughs> I'm just yeah. curious if, if you would say more about how you determine where particular logic goes in terms of like, within Drupal templates or within Pattern Lab templates and like how you wire those up? Um, I know it's a big topic, but. Well, I mean, I everything sure. is literally in the, tr the Twig templates that we're writing for mm -hmm. these systems. And it's only components and layouts. Um, the patterns technically are using Twig, but mm -hmm. like again, it's just a recipe looping through. Sure. We're not doing anything on the Drupal side in terms of templating. Uh, the modules that we're using to, to map Drupal fields mm -hmm. are really just PHP modules, and they're just saying, take this field, render it here. Take this field, render it here. So again, there's no templates there. So I don't know if that well, yeah. I, I will say there's a little bit of logic around translation. Um, and mm -hmm. so what we'll do, Drupal will sometimes be parsing the content to say, like, oh, right. put this through the translation tool. Or um, they might be like rendering a date. In, it mm -hmm. might be in UTC time. And we're like converting it into like a pretty print and rendering right. it through our pattern. But Drupal, the only thing that we're doing on the mapping side that's logic based mm -hmm. is around manipulating the content and then injecting the content into those fields that exist in our Twig templates. They're, they're not actually messing with any HTML or styles. OK, that makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else have other questions? How are we doing on time? You guys got into definitions with your schemes yet? So breaking apart your schema into the easy small schemes that are corrected by your students. Yes. OK. <laughs> the question is, have we gotten into schemas um, or breaking it down into really small pieces? Um, yes. Yeah, so
Yes. Okay, so we do have one atom called I config. Just to point, I can't see that there you oh, thank you. That's way more useful. Um, okay, so we actually we have one config atom, which is kind of a little house for all of our settings that we keep reusing over again, like background color or alignment or things like this. So what I'm showing you here is probably the most inception-like pattern that we're doing in our system. This is our agenda pattern. And every time we reference something, hold on, there's a mouse. Every time we reference something, um, we're basically calling another template. So I just kind of wanted to showcase here. First one is a pattern, which references a daily agenda, JSON schema, which is a sub-pattern. And you can see here up at the top, here's the category. And then we get down into the body of that sub-pattern, and we're referencing a time slot row, which is a layout. So we come over here, time slot row is also, oh, it's a sub-pattern, just kidding. Uh, the time slot row references session and session breakout, because in this particular instance, we, had, we wanted people to be able to build dynamic agendas, and they might be loading a regular session, but it might be a breakout. We wanted to give them some color coding options and things. So this is an array where they can choose one or the other as they're building it out. So you can see here, this is our session component, and then our session breakout um, sub-pattern. Sub yeah, oh yeah, because inception, because it keeps going. <laughs> and so then that one is then calling more layouts and more components. It's been a little while since I've looked at this. So you're not seeing, the, I'm not pointing to the layouts in this screenshot here, but it's actually loading all of this stuff inside um, a clean table layout, and then there's a table row layout and things like this. So I don't know if that helps. Usually for me, looking at code kind of leads, <coughs> leads to some answers. Um, did you want to add to that? Or? No, no. Okay. Great. I love this example. And then, since y'all are still here, thank you so much for being dedicated. Um, I have some more sneak peek slides if you want to see more code. <laughs> <laughs> Always. We just got to get through the DrupalCon stuff. Do Drupal actually reference They're not being validated, <laughs> okay. which makes me sad. But eventually, we will validate them against our schemas. They can pretty much inject any variable that they want into our, our twig. Right. Not in, no, not in Drupal. <laughs> so Drupal's not doing any schema validation whatsoever. I, I mean, the twig is like by itself. Yeah, well, we're not on D8, so we're kind of loosely using twig. Um, when we move to D8, I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we wrote a module, a custom module called Pattern Builder Importer that basically walks through the schema and turns it into a paragraph bundle. So it is creating all of the fields, but it's blissfully unaware of the layouts that are behind the scenes. We're just using those twig templates. Um, so here's a sneak peek into the, the schemas again because I wanted to highlight if there's a field, if there's an opportunity to reuse a field on its own, um, we can reference an individual field so we don't have to recreate all of those. So in Drupal, uh, if it already exists as a component, that's a field base. When we reference it a second time, that's another instance of that same field. So it doesn't have to re recreate it there. And here's what it looks like if you were to look at the actual paragraph bundle. You can see that those field names are exactly the same in the component and the subpattern. And there's the UI, which, sexy. <laughs> and then here's the schema that's basically showcasing um, a component and a subpattern, or sorry, a subpattern that is referencing an entire component. So we've kind of gotten away from this as time has gone on because, again, once you give them a whole component, you can't take it back. Now your content editors have access to all of that stuff. So we do this less and less, uh, but in this example, it's referencing the whole thing. So all of the fields that are defined in the component are now showing up inside of that subpattern. So in the paragraph bundle, it's just an entity reference. And so you can see it's just pointing to another embedded pattern. Um, the component itself is another paragraph bundle. And so it's just referenced that way. And here it is inside of the editor UI. Anton, you have a question? Yeah, one question about terminology. You are using a term atom in your system, but you are not using molecules, organisms, and other terms from atomic design. Uh, is there any special reason for that? And why did you decide to go away from this methodology? Um, you should tweet at Micah about that. <laughs> <laughs> so Micah kind of came up with the naming constructs. I think it really came from a place of simplicity because if you're going to build a schema for a thing, you don't, do you really want to have like five different ways of naming it? Or is it easier to just call it a component, which is fields, 
or a layout, which is just a bucket. <laughs> so we started with those, and then we kind of built upon it, and Patterns was the original um, MVC where we were showcasing it to the editor, and then somewhere along the way we were like, sub-patterns are a better way to go because we kind of saw the same you know, repetition inside of a pattern over and over again. Um, so patterns are just the recipes. So it was really just trying to boil it down to what was most important and not get lost in the naming conventions. That's my loose answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's quite interesting because many companies actually switching from atomic design terminology to their own terminology. And, so what uh, was the second one? I mean, it uh, doesn't matter. Many companies implement uh, their own language for the design components. Yeah. So atomic uh, ter terms doesn't work well in real life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Naming is hard. Naming <laughs> so is hard, yeah. You have to do what works for your team and you know, use names that make sense to them as long as they understand it. Yeah. That's Absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you so much, guys. I'm gonna use it at work. I'm gonna do like all my presentations with this and like laser pointer and everything. Yeah. Hey. Awesome but question. I, yeah. <laughs> I just want to say that when it comes time, like at the VA, you can hire Tony Star and I yeah. to uh, come in and do that shit. We can just tip out the booth and sat and talk and talk and talk. I was chatting with him b b like before he submitted his session to try to like get an understanding of what he was gonna talk about. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, smart dude. I was like, the conversation with him was like, just like with, with him was like, how I talk with Kendall about every two months and we just geek out about all this stuff. So, yeah. yeah. I think one sparkle notebook left. Problem. Does anyone so, want my sparkle notebook? Yeah. Yeah. One more swag? Anyone oh, kids? all right. So, yeah. What's, text me like our sparkle notebook. Oh, oh. Just gotta self organize. Okay. Well, it's Google Hangouts, whatever, wherever you go. Google Hangouts. <laughs> yeah, that's what. That's the text messaging thing. That's how I get your messages. Oh, Google. I you meant, like, shooting over video. Oh, no. Like, <laughs> no, no. Hey, thanks for coming. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, so no, I did not pick my own session. Real tight with Micah. Didn't I'm, do it. I'm real happy with his line. He's worked at Microsoft since we've gone really well. And no, we're allowed to, really to, but we always have to, like, He just discovered you. There's a word for where you basically bow out. You say, if I was going to submit something to my own track, I can't vote on it. You know, you guys decide or whatever. What's that? It, there you go. Thank you very much. We're cute. You know, something that, like, oh, no. oh I'll work on mm -hmm. that. never going to do. Yeah. <laughs> we borrow a lot from Micah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, this is my sharing. Okay. I love it. It's always like, 